or medical economics these days are just not awesome. They're not, it, it's, a, it's a challenging time. And there are so many things that we come to the University of Washington to do that just don't happen without philanthropy, that just don't advance the careers of our fellows, that just don't advance science, that don't advance clinical care. And so the contribution of John in honor of his stepfather, Bob Bruce, we all know Bruce's name, the Bruce Protocol, the first division head of cardiology, arguably the most famous cardiologist to come out of the University of Washington by virtue of, you know, a worldwide used test with his name attached to it. Uh, John uh, very kindly um, has donated the funds to allow Lee, who's going to be speaking in a bit, um, and other fellows to be able to do their research, really get their careers started. And we have a whole litany of fellows who've really become thriving faculty members, courtesy of the Laughlin's and their donations. So I really, 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 from the uh, bottom of the division's heart, um, want to thank you for your donation and really emphasize how much of a difference it makes. And thank you for everybody who's coming here. The other introduction I'm going to make, just I think because people don't necessarily know her, is uh, Dr. Rong Tian, who is Dr. Bacchus's mentor for his research, and she's going to be introducing Lee. Um, Rong, for those of you who don't know her, is an extraordinarily accomplished researcher. Um, primary home is in anesthesiology and bioengineering, but she has mentored multiples of our fellows. Um, and I really thought that it was important that she originally, or her training was China to Denmark to Harvard, where she rose through the ranks to an associate professor until she was recruited here. And she has mentored a ton of fellows, has a bazillion publications, all of the great accomplishments. And many of us will see her name, but hadn't necessarily met her or knew exactly who she was. So she's been an incredibly valuable partner for the Division of Cardiology in advancing the scholarship of our fellows. And then the last thing I will get to introduce for next year is the recipient of the Laughlin Fellowship for next year is Dr. Andy Westcott. And this is the only thing I need to phone for. Um, he's going to be working with Chuck Murray in the Murray Lab. And his research is entitled Mechanisms of Arrhythmogenic Calcium Release in Cardiac Stem Cell Therapy. So very excited to have Andy be the recipient for next year. And more importantly, let's move on to this year's recipient and his mentor. And I believe, Dr. Tian, you were going to be introducing Dr. Bacchus. Thanks, everybody. Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, also, uh, for those who, that I can't see on, on the Zoom, and uh, it, it is really an honor to, to be here and introduce uh, this year's uh, Bruce Laughlin uh, Research Fellow. And also, thank you, Karen, for that uh, um, overly nice introduction. And I've been doing cardiovascular research all my life, so coming to cardiology division is felt, felt really like coming home. Um, thank you for having me and allow me to do research with your fellows. And I'll introduce Lee. Um, so um, I, I will do a, a formal introduction to start with and then make some observations of my year working with Lee. And so Lee um, got his uh, MD, PhD from University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. And then he went on to the residency at uh, Stanford and then coming here at the University of Washington as a cardiology fellow on the research track. Um, I, I don't exactly remember how I get connected with Lee, but I remember our first uh, uh, meeting that's supposed to be half an hour and went into two hours. So we just keep talking about the metabolism, heart disease, what is the ambition of doing research in that area and what he knows about it. I was so impressed with a, a, a fellow who knows so much and knows exactly what he wants. And the, so without even uh, knowing him before and uh, uh, having worked with him at not having worked with him at all, and I agree to be his member. And I also want to make an observation that uh, um, his two years of clinical fellow, he actually worked with a number of faculties in, in our, uh, this division, has already done extensive research that has led to an uh, impressive five publications, either accepted or in submission for anyone who has such a busy clinical schedule and training, has accomplished so much, it's truly impressive. Congratulations, Lee. 
and uh, um, Lee has Lee's work has led to a number of recognitions award, including twice uh, of uh, uh, ACC's Hard Tank uh, competition finalist, and he was the winner uh, last year. And uh, also recognized by the Lennox Award of American Heart Association, and of course the uh, Bruce Laughlin Research Fellowship, which, which is a great honor, and uh, um, we recognize today. And um, so, uh, in the last year, Lee started to work with us and um, towards cardiac metabolism and uh, diagnosis and treatment. And so, Lee's ambition in this area in his own words, is to perform preclinical and translational research that would lead to the first in-class therapy for heart failure, diabetes, and metabolic disorders. I, I think I took that from your uh, your resume. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge ambition. And uh, so we're all here rooting for him. And I think today he's going to give us a glimpse of where he is in that uh, big uh, uh, journey. So Lee, please. Um, thank you so much uh, for the Laughlins for having me today. Uh, incredibly grateful for your support. Um, you all are incredibly generous and you've kind of nurtured the early career of so many scientists here that there's 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 really no way forward uh, with without help like your all's so incredibly grateful. Um, Dr. Tian, it's an absolute honor to work with her uh, to finish her story. I actually reached out the week after I matched at UW because I knew in coming here exactly who I wanted to work with, um, and I probably reached out with a host of about six ideas uh, that she at least thought this person spent enough time thinking about this. Maybe I can give him a call. So um, things things grew from there. Um, uh, the, the name of this talk is going to be The Power of AV Gradients. Um, what that actually means, we'll get into. Um, it actually spurred from uh, something I brought up with Dr. Tian my first month here at UW. Uh, the concept was perhaps we can sample blood uh, going into the heart, essentially from any arterial source, sample blood coming out of the heart from the coronary sinus, and kind of back solve exactly what the heart is putting in and taking out of the blood. So both of us have a cardiometabolism background. So things I had in mind are things like lipid utilization, glucose use, et cetera. Um, I tried to kind of create a bit of a broader appeal with this talk since it's to the whole department. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how AV gradients can use uh, can be used for, for different things beyond that. Um, also to finish that initial pitch, um, I, I wanted to do this in HEFREF patients. Uh, it hadn't been done in cardiology before. Um, and two months later, uh, uh, article was published uh, with that exact same project. So um, in science, you often think you're creative and original and you're rarely either. So um, always a good lesson to learn early. <laughs> Anyways, um, without further ado, um, let's go through both uh, heart failure and arrhythmia today. And I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. Uh, today, um, first, I'll go into the, the method itself for a bit of time, and we'll talk about how we can use it for ventricular studies. Uh, the majority of this talk will actually be surrounding heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, um, which is my primary focus. Um, we'll have a fairly large rabbit hole down into physiology um, that you'll just uh, have to journey with me. Um, and then we'll also see how we can apply this to atrial studies, um, something that is a completely novel technique um, that Dr. Kuma uh, has been working on with us. Uh, Multi-omic approaches have really revolutionized the level of detail that we're able to get from patient studies. There's uh, genomics leading into transcriptomics, leading into proteomics, and finally into metabolomics. And all four of these fields play off of each other. Um, I'm specifically interested in metabolomics because it's often the result of uh, proteins that are directly active. Uh, we can see about 700 to 1,000 species in one sample um, and get a very comprehensive profile of what's going on in our patients. What, what has slowed this field is that you're taking one snapshot into what's going on with the patient. For example, even if you are able to get heart tissue, 
Um, all you can say is what is inside that heart tissue at that given time and place. So beyond just the difficulty of getting tissue, uh, a major problem is uh, we can't really infer flux um, with any of the most common techniques behind these. So in metabolism, we want to know what people are using and why. That's not something we can necessarily answer with, uh, with tissue. So there are limited ways currently to study organ-specific flux. Uh, it generally involves nuclear tracers, um, which are incredibly costly. Um, you can generally just study one pathway at a time, uh, require complex imaging, um, or something called fluxomics, uh, which is kind of a hybrid approach. So to circumvent these problems, let me introduce you to arteriovenous gradients, or AV gradients. The most important advantage of these is that we now have the ability to infer organ-specific flux uh, of uh, virtually any substrate that you can detect. And this is done by uh, pulling arterial blood from any source, assuming that it's the same throughout the body. Uh, whatever organ you're interested in, in our case, the heart, uh, you then need a very clean sample of blood draining from that organ. And this was originally used in different organs, um, has been used on arms and legs, uh, depending on what people are interested in. Uh, but this is a, a, a burgeoning field that um, I hope you dub will be at the forefront of. Uh, the, the earliest AV gradient uh, uses um, were back in the 50s. Um, uh, this was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Corey. Uh, this led to their Nobel Prize discovery of the Corey cycle. Um, uh, De Jong was one of the first who did a cardiac specific AV gradient, um, just directly measuring glucose and lactate and showing how they changed during ischemia. Um, in 2015, uh, we had the first use of metabolomics applying a modern technique uh, to kind of a, to an, an old measurement uh, in a way that really showed the potential power of this technique, um, looking at gradients across the arm. Uh, finally, the paper in 2020, uh, they both validated and supplanted what I was, I was wanting to do, um, really opened up the field for cardiology, and I think has created a ton of interest in this. A really important piece of this is we want to actually know flux of substrates, regardless of its hormones or anything you're interested in. We want to know how it's changing, how it's going in and out of the heart. Um, so an important piece of this is you need to know regional blood flow in the area to back calculate uh, what your actual flux is in and out of the tissue. That's something I'll touch on later, but won't spend too much time on. What can you study? Anything you can detect in blood. There's a little more detail though. There's a few things that I think work a little bit better than, than others. Um, anything that has a long half-life is difficult because you won't see a large gradient. Um, things that have shorter half-life metabolites are ideal. Uh, that's why this fits into my area of cardiometabolism so well and why I'm so interested in it. Oxygen utilization, something that we'll touch on later, uh, works very, very well for this. And it's something simple, but, awesome, uh, but often we don't have data behind. Um, inflammatory signals, uh, I think cytokine panels um, uh, would, ex would really excel in this space, knowing what the tissues are actually producing, not just what's circulating. Similar to biomarkers, it can tell you about their production from a tissue. Uh, microRNAs and, uh, and connection to proteomics, um, I think are kind of future fields that, that haven't really started yet for this. All right. So let's see how we can apply this to ventricular studies. I specifically didn't put heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the title because I was afraid I'd have zero fellows show up. So uh, I'm glad we have the support of Ford today. That's much better than I would have done otherwise. <laughs> um, first, um, let's see how the paper in 2020, uh, this is from Zoltar Rani's lab out of Penn, uh, applied this technique. Um, they drew uh, arterial blood uh, from the radial artery coronary sinus blood, um, just as I had mentioned before. And then they also drew from the femoral vein. Uh, this gave them two different gradients. One was across the leg, um, kind of a composite of skeletal muscle and adipose tissue primarily. Uh, the other gradient was across the heart. Um, and their goal was to see essentially how metabolites are going in and out of the heart in the fasting state during, uh, um, during EP ablation procedures. Um, we'll be going into into some details uh, beyond this, but um, things that stand out are there's increased ketone utilization by the heart 
um, in HEFREF patients compared to preserved ejection fraction patients or controls. Um, lactate use uh, was also elevated. Um, th this, this gives a lot of data, and I think the interpretation of it is really what's difficult in this. Um, we can say these substrates are going in and out of the heart, more or less, in heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction versus controls. Um, but trying to put it into a comprehensive picture can be quite difficult. Uh, for them, they're studying both uh, atrial ablations and PVC ablations um, and found that ketones and lactates were used more readily. Um, a few things, a, a few of our concerns with this paper and things that we're incorporating into our project is one, it doesn't incorporate blood flow. So we can't really say anything about total flux. Uh, we can say things about proportionally how substrates have changed, uh, which is still valuable. I'm also with PVC ablation patients, presumably uh, more common in HEFREF, likely have some level of disease, uh, disease ventricle. So we're kind of curious how these different factors can confound the data. Uh, also similar, uh, vasoactive support uh, during anesthesia um, could likely alter metabolism substantially with beta-1 signaling. Moving to half-path. We know that there is reduced energy reserve in half-path patients. That's been known since this paper came out in 2009. I won't go into the details of this, but uh, it used magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, as a way to show uh, a reduction in uh, creatine phosphate to ATP ratio. Don't worry about the details of that. Just trust me. <laughs> there's there's reduced uh, there's reduced energy reserves and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this kind of leads us to a major question: Why? Um, I kind of view this as the uh, cardiac metabolic cycle, and its point is to illustrate how, regardless of where. Uh, a, a patient has, um, has, has some deficient cardiac uh, pathology, um, it still ends up with the same endpoint of impaired metabolism. So we often think metabolism, of course, is the process going on at the end. So perhaps it's impaired in these patients, but that's hard to conclude. Really, diastolic dysfunction uh, can reduce cardiac power itself. Systolic dysfunction reduces cardiac power, affects macrovascular flow, affects microvascular flow, we know that there's reduced capillary density in half half patients uh, with a question of, of impaired cell transport in these patients as well. All of these lead up to metabolism and it's such a heterogeneous disease. Um, you have to kind of know exactly where each patient has a deficiency. And unfortunately it ends up being kind of a spectrum between all of these. Uh, the biggest paper in the field to come out um, was just a few months ago. Um, this is uh, based off of David Cass's group uh, that does right ventricular biopsies um, in half PEF patients. Uh, he compared it to cadaveric controls. Um, so this is looking at tissue, uh, kind of similar to what I mentioned earlier, this is not flux, um, but it does give us a little bit of insight and lets us infer to some extent what's, what's going on in these patients. Uh, first, by primary component analysis, uh, the group showed that there's separation between controls half puff patients and half rough patients. It's fairly straightforward. And this is based off their, their metabolomic patterns. So we know we at least have three discrete groups with half puff having clear separation. Um, what they then found was compared to controls, which are this green outside ring, if we're looking at acyl carnitines or just view that as a surrogate for fatty acid utilization or fatty acid capacity, um, you can see both half puff and half rough have dramatically reduced content of both of these. So it gives us a, a reason directly why metabolism potentially could be compared, per, impaired. Perhaps we just don't have the substrates uh, being, in a, a, being there at an adequate concentration. But according to the, to the metabolic cycle, that can still be from multiple points around the pathway. So they conclude um, that there's lower fatty acid metabolites compared to HEFREF. Um, Ketones, uh, kind of similar to the other, were actually lower in half path tissue. Um, so they show that there's insufficient fuels, kind of regardless of substrate the heart could use. All right, so how do we determine where the deficiency is? This, this is a really difficult and kind of individual patient by patient question. Um, from our standpoint, we don't necessarily have angiograms in all these patients, uh, but I'll kind of uh, walk you through kind of how we split between these different compartments uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, 
Um, long story short, it, requ it requires detailed physiologic subphenotyping um, combined with your metabolic assessment to try to adjust for all these confounding variables or potentially confounding. Our goal is to characterize alterations in cardiac metabolism in patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction compared to controls um, in tandem uh, with this physiology based system. And the point is to adjust for the heterogeneity of the disease. Uh, we hypothesize that in HEPF patients, there will likely be increased lipid utilization concurrent with reduced usage of alternative substrates. And now we have that previous paper to put that in context of uh, reduction of multiple substrates on an intracellular level. Our patient cohort, um, thanks to Dr. Coombe and the very generous EP group, um, our patients and matched non kneeling patients undergoing elective catheter ablation for AFib, atrial fibrillation. Um, three major categories that we're ex excluding from this are patients with a prior history of HEFREF or current history of HEFREF, congenital heart disease, because they're not as smart as Dr. Krieger, uh, and greater than moderate valve disease. And this, this brings us to a very important question is how do we define HEFPEF in this cohort? Um, uh, we've gone through multiple ways to answer this question, and I think we're settling on, on one that's, uh, that's correct. Um, instead of doing something more customized, uh, we actually have uh, uh, useful HEFPEF score, scoring systems. Uh, the H2FPEF uh, that you heard about last week um, is probably the most common. Uh, the problem with it is the, the, highest, uh, the highest points actually come from atrial fibrillation. So it is actually uh, completely useless in our specific setting. Um, but I'm very thankful for ESC because um, per their guidelines, they use HFAPEF, um, which is more inclusive of echocardiographic parameters and natriuretic peptides. I won't go through the details of this too much, uh, but there is both structural echocardiac parameters as well as functional that are generally fairly akin to formal diastology grading, um, as well as natriuretic peptides uh, referring to if the patient is in sinus or in AFib. So this really checks all of our boxes um, uh, and kind of makes defining our group a lot easier in a field that's pretty difficult to define your group. Our patient population so far, um, our control group has 22 patients, our HFF group has 14. Um, this has uh, continued to, to dramatically accelerate uh, as Dr. Kim's workload is always exploding. Um, we have more and more patients, which is fantastic for me. Um, very easily, you can see the separation and natriuretic peptides that we have. What's interesting in this group, I think, I'll, I'll bring your attention to, to the baseline demographics, is it, it tells you a bit about what phenotype of HEFPEF we're studying. Um, our HEFPEF patients, they're substantially older by about 15 years on average. Uh, they're also predominantly female, and this is in a fairly stark contrast to our control population. So we know we're studying the older female uh subphenotype of half pef in a sense it's it's kind of the cleanest phenotype um and that it's not confounded by severe hypertension chronically uh, or diabetes as the main driving factor behind the disease there's pros and cons of studying each subphenotype but this is the one that we're best able to study um are uh, kind of other options uh, for what subphenotypes people are able to study. Um, AFib and chronic kidney disease uh, is a big category. Diabetes and obesity is a massive category, which interestingly is very underrepresented in our cohort. And um, we actually just enrolled our first diabetic patient this past month out of, uh, of uh, after uh, compared to almost 40 patients. And so that's pretty shocking really. Uh, but also kind of tells us how clean our, our subphenotype is. Um, we have a lot of tools to use at our disposal, and this list is fairly dull to me, but I think uh, it'll come more alive when I get to walk you through how we're using it and what questions we're answering with it. Um, but we have echocardiography, we have cardiac MRI, um, uh, including 4D flow, which is essential. Uh, Dr. Kuhn is able to do uh, heart catheterizations, and we have direct left atrial pressure from procedures. Um, we've been able to back calculate VO2 through anesthesia. Um, we also have intracardiac echo, um, which is giving us a lot of um, kind of novel uh, insights into coronary sinus flow. 
um, and kind of the last step of this, uh, which is sent uh, later in the process, is our metabolomics. Um, looking at our two patient cohorts that I've described, um, systolic function is fairly similar between both groups. Um, interestingly, uh, TAPSI, of course, is different, but this is largely driven by the increased uh, RV systolic pressure or pulmonary artery pressure. Um, diastolic function, uh, not surprisingly at all, um, is, is down in all half path patients. Interestingly, biologistic, uh, biologistic regression, when you uh, ask for age and gender, um, it considerably associations, showing how age and gender, again, are two primary drivers in our cohort. Um, what I'm next going to bring you through is something that I, I want critical feedback on. If, if you don't feel like uh, doing that in person, please email me afterwards. Um, but I, I want all, all of your all's opinion. Um, and I'm looking at this one specifically because it incorporates a lot of the different uh, techniques that we're using uh, in a way that I think answers a very interesting question. Um, and this is something that I'm calling oxygen efficiency. And the concept is how much cardiac power is generated from how much oxygen each patient is using. And how, how does this change in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Why that could potentially change? One, the choice of metabolic substrates actually dictates how much oxygen is required for energy used. Um, but it also tells us something about structural inefficiencies. Uh, what's required for this? We, we need to have cardiac power, um, something that I'll go into more detail on. Um, uh, because the traditional formula isn't exactly what, what we're looking for here. Next, uh, we need a very detailed cardiac oxygen consumption. This sounds like an easy concept. It's very hard uh, to determine accurately. Um, it's something that I, I hope you see uh, some creativity behind. What we hypothesize is that a reliance on fatty acids as a predominant energy substrate um, will cause HEP patients to have less efficient oxygen utilization. Um, that said, I'll give it, I'll certainly say the caveat. Um, I think there's a large structural inefficiency component to this as well. It's like a trick here. Um, cardiac power uh, from the shock trial, uh, we're used to seeing it as just cardiac output times mean atrial power. Um, that's initially even just based off of a simple FIC estimate. Um, that's not really accurate enough for research. Um, so we calculated VO2 based off of minute ventilation and oxygen extraction. So that gets us to the full FIC equation. Next, let's talk a bit about cardiac power because really you have two circuits in tandem. Um, you have two resistors in those circuits. Now you have the pulmonary resistance and the systemic vascular resistance. So conceptually, I think it's first best to separate the two ventricles uh, and their downstream resistance beds. Very similar to our nor normal cardiac output, uh, except that we also need to incorporate filling pressures. For example, if a filling pressure is 15 and the output is also 15, you know, there's zero power coming from the ventricle. So incorporating both of those, for example, for the uh, right ventricle, we now have the right atrial filling pressure to compensate for the pressure going in by the pulmonary artery mean pressure after the ventricle. And this will be multiplied by the cardiac output to calculate RV power. Same concept for the left ventricle. Interestingly, um, our patients uh, have mildly reduced LV power, um, obviously a trend. Uh, right ventricular power is the same. I think it's kind of a good uh, illustration of how TAPSI uh, is, is often inaccurate in this population. Combining the two is something that to, to not call cardiac power because that would create confusion, I call myocardial power. And this is now combining, combining the right and the left ventricle. Um, you subtract the two filling pressures for both. Uh, you add the two downstream average pressures and you multiply by cardiac output. Um, shunts and significant regurgitation get a lot more complex. And at that point, you're trying to back derive the equivalent of PV loops. Um, so the myocardial power in our cohort um, it's slightly less than a half path group compared to controls on average, obviously. Okay, so we have one important part of the equation. Now let's talk about oxygen utilization. The easy part is the oxygen saturation. So we have our coronary sinus sample, we have our left atrium sample. We can tell the difference between the two. We have hemoglobin from labs. We can calculate now the actual volume of oxygen extracted 
across the myocardium. But that doesn't tell us the flow rate. Um, and this is, this is where life gets difficult. Uh, coronary artery flow is essentially equivalent to myocardial blood flow and minus about a 5% loss that I, I won't discuss today is essentially equal to the coronary sinus flow. Um, so your choice is basically which, uh, which of these three is going to be the easiest for you to measure um, in your research study. For us, it's definitely coronary sinus flow. One way we can do this is by free flow uh, through cardiac MRI. Uh, this is something that, uh, that Yacoub, um, uh, one of Dr. Coombs' postdocs, um, has, has really made a lot of headway in and has done an incredible job. Um, you'll, you'll see the flow pattern through the coronary sinus. Uh, an average per beat. It generally has forward flow, actually has a little bit of backwards flow depending on the patient. And through that and the cross-sectional area, as you would do with a lot of different echo structures really, um, you can determine the minute uh, volume, the volume per minute flow through the coronary sinus. And this is the piece of information we need, but we still have a problem. This isn't during the procedure. We intubate patients, we sedate them, um, and this is, uh, this created a new problem on something that I hope we had a solution on, which has kind of been the story of a lot of this. So this brings us to intracardiac echocardiography. We do have an accurate cross-sectional area of the coronary sinus. So really all we need is real-time flow during the procedure. And what we've been able to do, um, this one is actually completely determined uh, by ice because I took the, the length of the coronary sinus. That's not what we're generally doing. Um, but we're able to get Doppler tracings uh, from the coronary sinus flow. Typically in most patients, it peaks at about 50 centimeters per second. Um, it does vary from patient to patient and actually fairly similar to what we had learned from PET for myocardial perfusion rates. Um, tend to typically fall in that 50 to 100 cc's per, per minute for myocardial blood flow. So next, how can, how can we combine all of these things? Um, we, we have the coronary sinus net flow. That's an important piece. And we also have uh, the oxygen being pulled out, uh, going, being pulled out of the blood. And this is how we can finally combine it with cardiac power to calculate oxygen efficiency. A very long-winded way of answering this question that we started with. Um, we found that in FF patients, uh, the amount of oxygen required uh, for, the uh, for the amount of myocardial power generated um, is actually higher. Um, I, I, I don't, it, just ignore the p-value on this. Our numbers aren't high enough for, for me to completely believe this result yet. Um, but so far, we've, we've had a good pattern. It's kind of a proof of concept that perhaps FF patients uh, do have issues with oxygen handling and driving that oxygen into cardiac power. The next step in this, I've mentioned this could either be structural inefficiency or this could be an issue with uh, oxygen utilization. We can determine the difference between those once we have metabolomics. With metabolomics, we can actually calculate how much ATP the heart should be generating per amount of metabolite taken into the heart. Um, in this way, uh, we no longer are looking at the difference in oxygen utilization between substrates. We now are purely looking uh, at ATP produced and the power generated. This looks at structural inefficiency. All right, uh, physiology for a bit um, and back to the bread and butter of, of metabolism. Um, in, our, in our pilot study, uh, we've demonstrated that in these samples, um, we can accurately quantify 650 different metabolites. Um, we, can, we can say if they're going into the heart, if they're going out of the heart, and it gives us a comprehensive picture of how all these different pathways are interacting. Um, a very important output of this um, is, um, is actually the percent of oxygen uh, uh, utilized per metabolic substrate compared to the amount of oxygen that's actually pulled out of blood. Um, that's, a, that's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but the idea is that for every metabolite pulled into the heart, you calculate how much oxygen it requires to combust or metabolize. And then you compare that to what the heart is actually using from an oxygen standpoint. And it lets us put it on a relative scale. For example, on the right, in kind of the, the cleaner fashion, you can see free fatty acids are a predominant energy source for the heart in this pilot study. 
uh, we'll have our metabolic data, data later this year. So I'm excited to share that at a future presentation if you all decide to have me back again at some point. All right, next, um, let's talk about how this can be used for atrial studies. And I realize we're a little bit short on time, so um, I'll kind of touch on some of the things that we're most excited about. And thanks to Dr. Kuhn for, for letting me show some of this, because I think we're both very excited about it. Now for atrial studies, um, it's as, as difficult as getting tissue is from ventricles, it's harder from atria. It's harder to image atria, they're small, so nuclear studies don't have the spatial resolution that, that you really need for accurate quantification. Um, so there's an even greater need for potentially doing these AV gradients in the atrial field. But our only option um, is something called the vein of Marshall. The atrial venous drainage, which is what you need to set up your AV gradient, uh, is very complex. You have some draining directly in the left atrium, into the right atrium, some to the mediastinum. Um, but the only consistent, fairly consistent source that you have is the vein of Marshall. Um, it's about three millimeters across, so I'm glad that it's not my hands doing this, and it's somebody much more talented than me. Um, but this lets us set up these AV gradients, and this is a completely novel approach. Um, there's nobody else in the field doing this, so it's a really fun uh, open space and a place that, that you really can be creative. What we hypothesize is that in the excited toxic state of atrial fibrillation, you will likely be burning through a lot more oxygen, uh, many more metabolic substrates, and a very inefficient use um, of, of, uh, of everything that's coming into the atrial tissue. How Dr. Kuhn is able to do this um, is uh, he's able to cannulate the vein of Marshall, very similar to, uh, to the protocol that was originally uh, pushed for, uh, for the vein of Marshall ablation procedures. Um, but a very important piece uh, is that a balloon is actually inflated um, in the vein. The blood flow is incredibly slow, and it's very important for you to have a very pure blood sample. Um, what this allows us to do is then get a small volume of a very pure atrial venous drainage sample. Um, how this project is set up, um, we have control patients that are coming in, paroxysmal AFib and persistent AFib. These kind of let you compare each other, uh, regardless if you want to study predisposition to AFib or progression. Um, but what's really powerful is this, is we have a beautiful internal control, which is really hard to do in human studies. Um, we're able to, in the EPP lab, patients who present in atrial fibrillation, cardiovert into sinus rhythm. Similarly, patients who present in sinus rhythm, we can actually, uh, we can actually induce uh, into atrial fibrillation. So have we seen anything at all doing this? Um, is there a difference in atrial oxygen consumption is what we've been studying first, even though we're cataloging um, all of our samples for later analysis. But I'm, one thing I'm really excited to show you today is a patient who presented in atrial fibrillation, the original oxygen saturation coming out of the vein uh, was around 50%. We cardioverted the patient and the oxygen saturation uh, skyrocketed all the way up to 81%. Uh, to, to, to put that on scale for you, virtually every patient, their coronary sinus blood is somewhere in between 40 and 60, and there's not really much deviation outside of that. So the fact that there's a 62% reduction in oxygen extraction um, is, is massive. Similarly, you might be wondering, what if we induce atrial fibrillation? Do you see the opposite effect? Uh, this patient presented in uh, sinus rhythm um, with the oxygen saturation of 46%. Uh, when we induced atrial fibrillation in this patient, it plummeted down to 27%. And keep in mind, this is just a sum average. So there's probably some parts of the tissue uh, that are more hypoxic compared to others. Um, but again, a uh, very pronounced change. This beautifully internal controlled uh, with, with a large difference to study. Um, as I know some of you are probably thinking, just the oxygen saturation doesn't actually tell you if oxygen use is different. Because again, sort of like uh, the rest of AV gradients, we need to know flux. Um, the creative approach that we're trying, since the, uh, since the balloon is actually occlusive on the vein, is to time how long it takes to draw, and by that actually get the flow through the vein of Marshall. And that's how we can conclusively say um, that there is reduced oxygen consumption in sinus rhythm compared to atrial fibrillation. Uh, 
um, to start wrapping up uh, future directions, trying to think of what's the furthest we can really push this in the field of cardiology. Um, theoretically, uh, beyond the vein of Marshall to study atria, beyond the coronary sinus to study uh, the left ventricle, we could also cannulate the small cardiac vein for people who are interested in comparing the right to the left ventricle, for example, in something like ARVC. Um, uh, nobody has done that to date, so this is also a completely open field, um, which is exciting. Um, theoretically, you could have draws from all three sites before and after cardioversion or whatever intervention you're wanting to do, um, a way to really get mass and detailed data from individual patients. Uh, what can we study? Um, mostly, I want to hear from you all uh, after this talk at some point, what you all find interesting in cardiology, because um, there's a lot of different ways we can approach this and a lot of different disease states we can study. Um, and it's something I hope can really explode here, here at the University of Washington. Um, uh, today, I'll conclude by saying AV gradients represent an uh, expanding method, um, something that I think you'll see a lot more of uh, in the near future. Um, to allow study of tissue-specific processes uh, when tissue is not readily accessible. And it even has an advantage over tissues itself in that you can assess flux, uh, something that pairs incredibly well with metabolomics and studies of metabolism. Um, applying this technique uh, to understand the metabolism of heart failure preserved ejection fraction uh, must be combined with physiologic phenotyping, um, something that I hope you at least uh, got a bit of a taste of today. Um, and finally, that using AV gradients to study the atria is a, is a very novel technique uh, that has the potential to give us new insights into atrial fibrillation and other atrial disease. Um, ask me for references later if you'd like them, but those are the core ones from this. Um, I'd love to thank Dr. Tian. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to uh, have the opportunity to work with, uh, with such a vanguard in the field of cardiac metabolism. Um, I think our skill sets are very complementary. Um, she's the largest name in, in basic cardiometabolic research. Um, and it kind of lets me learn from her and work adjacent in a more clinical space. Um, so it's, it's great to be uh, put in a space that, that, um, that you're readily able to succeed and, and learn from great people. Um, Dr. Akum um, uh, has, been incredibly, uh, has been incredibly kind to work with us. Um, he's, he's our primary hands-on person for, uh, for uh, the vast majority um, of all of the procedures. Uh, Dr. O'Brien has, has been our heart failure support primarily. Uh, Dr. Nazar, uh, we're hoping to attempt uh, further and further into this space because um, I know he at least has some interest and we're always looking at expanding. Um, uh, Yakub, he'll be an intern here next year. Um, he's incredibly hardworking. Um, and as somebody who I could not have done this research without. Um, I would also like to give a shout out to our fellow Jason Lee. Um, he has great biostatistical knowledge um, and is always happy to work with people. So this has obviously taken a, a, a fairly large team um, to get going and has had a lot of support from the department. Um, I'm incredibly uh, thankful for the Raiseback family uh, and Dr. Fishbein um, for helping us fund this project. Um, something that we couldn't have moved forward um, but without the support, as, as well as the, the Locke Family Trust uh, through Dr. Akum. Um, and with that, I'll answer questions. Dr. Levy. Um, so it is sampled from right around this point. Um, you likely do get uh, influx from the right ventricle. Uh, the advantage is uh, we know there's only about 15% of the blood ballpark is coming from the right ventricle. Um, so it, uh, it does have some of that, but we're able to conclude that it is largely an LV sample. Um, if, if we wanted to have an incredibly precise LV sample, we could go further down uh, the, the great cardiac vein. Yes, so um, our ice probe is directly at the os, looking straight down the barrel of the gun um, by pulse Doppler. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I originally worked on with Dr. Kirkpatrick about a year ago. Um, 
uh, through transthoracic echo as well as TEE. Um, we finally kind of perfected it by ice. So. Yeah, Lee, that was a very nice talk and clearly powerful techniques. Um, I guess at some point you're going to be dealing with the issue of whether these metabolic abnormalities are the cause or the effect of, uh, of the HEFPEF. And, and I would make a note that um, your cardioversion and AFib data portray it more as an effect than a cause. Um. Yeah, so your idea being is oxygen handling driving the changes in metabolism uh, for AFib? The metabolic abnormality reversed when you um, cardioverted yeah. so that the meta metabolic abnormality was not a constant in the disease yep. causing yep. it, yep. it. Yep. but was the result of being in atrial fibrillation. Um, that's what I expect, actually, uh, for that specific exchange. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what we'll see is the really excited toxic state uh, will rely much more on glycolysis, um, sort of how ischemic tissue does. And I think that will reverse fairly readily. Yeah. More fundamental question of whether you're, whether these metabolic abnormalities are caused by the disease or are causing the disease. Yep. How are you going to confront that? Yeah, um, I think first it's important to define the problem in patients uh, to see what the changes are. And then, of course, uh, uh, searching more causative ways to study it is vital after that. Um, Dr. Tian's already light years ahead of me in mouse models uh, to, to look at a lot of these things from a causative standpoint. Um, so likely we'll already have answers once we, once we realize what's happening in patients, we can infer uh, what's causative and, and what isn't. Um, um, if not, I, I think that's the perfect time for animal models. Um, the causative uh, techniques in patients, uh, we can't really set up something like Mendelian randomization um, with this. There's just not enough data in the field. And, and when you have this figured out, what do you see as the early application in diagnosing and treating heart disease? Uh, great question. Um, for diagnosis, uh, I think likely there will be some independence uh, between patient groups on how their metabolism changes, uh, depending kind of what subphenotype they fall into. Um, as far as treatment, um, that gets incredibly difficult. Um, we have medications that can force people to use more, more lipids, um, but if the issue is just supply, if it really is a microvascular or cell transport problem, um, then those need to be the primary focus um, in those subsets of half path. Um, as far as something like atrial fibrillation, uh, if, if oxygen utilization is a major driver, um, you can try to augment oxygen-rich substrates such as ketones and glucose um, that have oxygen built into the molecule um, to try to perhaps enhance the um, success of cardioversion or something along those lines. Wrong, wrong's contributing something here, and then we'll get it to Nanto. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Turn green, oh, okay. Now I'm on. Uh, yeah, I, I want I want to follow up with this question. I think it's uh, really important to figure out whether me metabolic change is a cause or consequence of those uh, disease. And I thought your uh, vein of muscle uh, approach and, and the plus the conversion is really brilliant. I mean, it gave us amazing opportunity to look at those things. When I was looking at the data, you have a very striking change in oxygen consumption when you do the conversion. But if you look at the patient on chronic atrial fibrillation, it's different. That means the, the atria has really adapted to that. So I think it's adaptation is the meat. You want to find out how they adapt to this metabolic stress and the, the, uh, what's, uh, what drives that. And the, that maybe gave you more opportunities for diagnosis or therapy. Yeah, yeah, uh, I completely agree, and that's kind of in line with 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 what we're thinking. Um, it, it is interesting that regardless of if the patient presented in sinus or an AFib, their oxygen saturation was right around fifty percent. So you're completely right. There's some level of adaptation, and trying to think of how this kind of applies to the disease progression of AFib, I think likely the biggest connection is actually to left atrial enlargement over time when people are in atrial fibrillation. Uh, not to go into this too much, but um, different hypoxic states um, can actually drive left atrial dilation. 
uh, more so uh, than you'd expect otherwise. Um, so we think similar to even the left ventricle uh, in chronic hypoxic states dilating, and we think that's actually driving part of the left atrial dilation that then worsens the disease. So in that sense, it's kind of a spiral of atrial fibrillation when we leave them in, in, the, in the rhythm. Hey, Lee, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering uh, what what you think about the idea of um, measuring the impact of exercise on oxygen efficiency in HFPEF in HFPEF patients using your methods that you've described? Yeah, a beautiful question because, of course, exercise uh, intolerance is a hallmark of the disease. But we're really just studying these patients um, in 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 a fasted, anesthetized state. Um, it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, we would have to use an exercise mimetic, uh, so something chemical to kind of uh, model it as best as we could in the EP lab. Um, so something like isoproteranol, uh, you could potentially justify using. Um, but unfortunately, we just we can't have these invasive uh, catheters in patients during exercise. Um, if you're volunteering, uh, maybe get Dr. Mormon as well, um, and and we can measure his uh, his cardiac specific VO2, and I'll be very impressed. Uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting line of, of work and great combination of technique development along with everything else. And yeah, I nice. love that slide. Like, this is where we can go from here. We're using the technique. Um, one question in regards to subphenotyping, not just physiologically, but also the subphenotypes of HEFPEF, which of course have have made a major problem uh, for all of our investigation in that field for a long time because we haven't done a very good job of that. But that does raise interesting questions about the utilization of substrates in the metabolomics in sarcoid infiltration versus amyloid infiltration versus just hypertensive versus hef, uh, versus HCM and all of these different phenotypes. And the problem, of course, is that then getting enough patients in each subphenotype is going to be really difficult. But do you, do you think that that might be something that might either give you a better sense? Let's say, you know, we know that there's higher risks of a lot of things in patients with infiltrative cardiomyopathies and AFib, as opposed to those who don't have that. Is that something that might be elucidated by this? Or do you think it is just kind of all one big bucket and we're going to see similar Metabolomics. I don't think it's to be one big bucket. Um, I think based off of how difficult the HFPEF space has been when people take that approach, um, I think it's going to be very heterogeneous. Um, our talk, great talk last week uh, with a with a raise back talk was um, really helped illustrate um, how we need to be treating these patients different. Um, as far as your question on can we use this to determine how they're different, um, it's probably about as invasive as a biopsy, but minus taking the tissue. Uh, so yeah, perhaps if there's inconclusive stress testing um, and an inconclusive workup, uh, this could be something down the line that could be considered. Um, we'll, we'll really have to see our pilot data that's uh, hopefully we'll be getting back here in the next few months um, to kind of be able to touch on that more though. Yep. It's, it's a fun idea. Yeah, Lee, great talk. Uh, very creative, very creative. Um, so have you looked at, uh, how whole body oxygen consumption changes when you convert them to sinus and, uh, do you plan to look at, uh, metabolomic changes too? Yeah. So there's two pieces that I think would be interesting, interesting. Um, one, I, we can sample the PA. So that's kind of where I'd be checking whole body oxygen consumption. We can also resample just the coronary sinus proper. Um, that one we're definitely planning on doing. Uh, logistically, what happens is we'll be getting a arterial draw, pori sinus draw, vein of martial draw, cardiovert, and then basically go backwards um, on the way back out. Um, we've considered doing a PA draw uh, as a second one. Um, we aren't currently using it for metabolomics or really anything besides cardiac output. Uh, but the interesting side is actually the flip of it. If you compare it to arterial blood, you can actually, instead of studying the whole body, you can actually study the pulmonary circuit. Um, so there's kind of two different ways you can interpret it. Um, I'd have to look into somebody doing that for whole body oxygen consumption now. I don't know if that's been done before, to be honest. It, just real quickly, I assume that in the patients where you see some coronary sinus flow reversal, that's related to TR severity? Uh, that's what I expect, yeah. 
um, maybe the the submission valve could be involved or something along those lines, but I think it's primarily PR driven. So nobody in the uh, live audience is leaping out of their chair at the moment to ask the next question, but we have a couple that have come up in the Q&A that I'll ask you instead. Uh, Ted Gibbons, HFPF patients have reduced myocardial strain on echo, worse with symptom progression. Have you looked at strain and myocardial power in HFPF? No, that would be an interesting comparison. Um, I agree that likely these patients have subclinical systolic dysfunction, as we know about a lot of HFPF patients. Uh, especially the phenotype we're looking at being kind of the older female group. Um, we we haven't had enough strain uh, strain data on, on our echoes for me to really conclude that. Um, I always record strains, so as, as, as we get more data, uh, and maybe the fellows can always make sure to document it. Um, <laughs> Go back and do that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Retroactive and. But yeah, uh, yeah that would be very interesting. Yeah, perhaps they're both more sensitive than, than ejection fraction. Uh, Lyle Larson from the EP space. How would you? How would the presence of an LV lead in a subbranch of the coronary sinus affect your measurements? Uh, we specifically exclude that. Um, partly, um, that would throw off our intracardiac ec echocardiography. It would throw off our cross-sectional area. Um, we're also excluding HEFREF, so we haven't had any patients with a CRT lead. Is probably the main reason. So it hasn't been a problem yet, and I think regardless, we wouldn't do that. It's been an easy exclusion. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Melish Thompson, uh, interesting talk in your AFib study. How do you control for heart rate differences? Well, oh, interesting. Um, we we have heart rate recorded throughout. Um, I have not been doing uh, oxygen consumption per beat, um, but you're completely right uh, in that the, the relating tissue is about 300 beats per minute. Uh, dropping down to something in the range of, of 50 to 100. Um, perhaps that could have a direct effect. Uh, so we, we aren't controlling uh, for that, for the AFib studies. Uh, but yeah, that's a challenging question. Any other questions? Wayne. When you cardioverted patients, did you see any change in the coronary sinus oxygen consumption? given the fact that when we have people that we do AV junction ablation and pace with CRT and HEFREF, they have substantially improved outcomes in a randomized trial? Um, no, uh, the, the coronary sinus is very stable, um, but it, it's, it's akin to the comparison of a patient being in V-fib and then being and getting a draw and then converting to sinus rhythm. So atrial fibrillation is just such a dramatically different environment um, than sinus rhythm. Um, that it, that's, that's kind of what drives that huge difference. Uh, from, from the coronary sinus, there's not a huge difference in ventricular oxygen consumption. Great. Um, and right on time with the last two minutes again, uh, thank you to the Laughlins for the Bruce Laughlin Fellowship that allows Lee to do this work. Thank you for the many mentors who are in the room, including your fellow mates. Um, which is great. And I think congratulations to you on work. Anybody who can actually have the Corey cycle up there and get that many questions <laughs> clearly crushed a complicated pathway and explanation and engagement of an audience and something that's both clinically relevant, interesting, and has a potential to really understand cardiac uh, metabolics much better. So congratulations to everybody for the great work. We look forward to seeing folks who are coming to fellowship graduation tonight and then look forward to follow-up talk on your data uh, in the years to come and next year's uh, Bruce Laughlin Fellow, Dr. Westcott, um, and everybody have a great rest of your day. Great weekend. Mm -hmm.